Today I want to deal with a question or concern I get all the time from members and non-members alike. Nineteen years ago, if you would have met me, you would not have actually liked me very much. As a full-blown alcoholic coming out of the military, I was a punk. If you had met me, you know, you would have been like, no way. Nope, no, 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 no. You know, we already know that the Holy Spirit impresses or convicts our hearts with exactly how much Jesus cares for every one of us. We know that. We already discussed who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does. We talked about how the Holy Spirit works in each of our lives. We talked about the urgency, the necessity of opening our hearts to receive the Holy Spirit. We talked about the conditions to receive the Holy Spirit. And one of those conditions is using the gifts that you have been given to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last Sabbath, we talked about the need for us to have a good Christian experience. And the only way that you can actually do that is if you implement in your life the four pillars of the Christian life. And those are prayer, prayer, earnest personal Bible study, worship, and then the last one is Christian service. Christian service. You do know that I would not be here if it wasn't for Christian service. That's why I started with my testimony, and I'm going to end with my testimony. You see, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it states that we receive the Spirit, and then we shall be witnesses. See, we need to be committed to witness, which leads me to today's sermon as we actually, you know, do our visitor Sabbath, which is entitled, Finishing the Work. Finishing the Work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, today we are asking of your Holy Spirit to teach us through your word, to teach us the amazing destiny and future of your church. Open our hearts to see divine realities. Impress us with the moving of your spirit amongst these pews. Help us to see what you want to do in the world. Help us to catch the glorious vision of a finished work through the mighty moving of your Holy Spirit and help us to participate in that work. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few weeks ago, we talked about the Holy Spirit at the end of times. We talked about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the latter rain. And for us, you know, we talk for us to talk about the latter rain, you always have to talk about the early rain. And the reason we do that is, because we always have actually said this in this series, God will not give you the latter rain if you're not using the early rain. I'll say amen for you. Amen. Why give you more when you're using what you have? So today I want to concentrate on revival, meaning the finishing of God's work on earth. You see, when you look out over the world today, it doesn't look very promising for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. For example, let's take some numbers, right? Of the 7.9 billion people on planet earth, approximately only 32% or 2.6 billion are Christian. Isn't that surprising? I mean, we talk about finishing the work of God on earth, we talk about the gospel going to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But after 2,000 years of preaching the gospel, only 2.6 billion people are Christian. 2 billion are Muslim. 1.1 billion on planet earth are agnostic or atheist. 1.2 billion are Hindus. 506 million are Buddhist. And then... This complicates itself when you have over 4,000 religious groups. 
So when you look at the figures, it is pretty overwhelming. How will the gospel ever go over to the ends of the earth? But to make matters even more challenging, with, with about 25 million members, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church actually has a million members a year. 30 million people are visiting Seventh-day Adventist churches right now around the world. But if you just take the numbers, and this is how I make my living, doing that data analysis, say 25 million Adventists, that amounts to approximately 1% of all Christians and only a fraction of all the world's population. So how with a population of almost 8 billion people will a fraction of 1% ever take the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth so Jesus will come? I mean, looking at it from through human eyes, it seems impossible. And this is the question I get from members and non-members because, you see, people tend to look at things through human eyes only. They ask, how will the work of God on earth will be fulfilled? How will the work of God on earth ever be finished? I mean, is it possible for the gospel in the context of the three angels' message to circle the globe in a very short time? Can that be possible? How can every human being ever have a chance to hear Jesus' message? What will give us the breakthrough in the proclamation of the gospel that we long for? The answer is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The answer is that God is going to do something that we do not yet imagine. His promise is true. And his promise is actually found in Matthew 24 and verse 14. I want you to read it with me, please. Read. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom, come on, read, shall what? Be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then what? Shall the end come? Will Jesus keep his word? Will Jesus fulfill his, fulfill his promise? In spite of our questioning in our minds, in spite of our human doubts, we can thank God that the promises of Jesus are true, that this gospel of the kingdom might be preached in all the world, right? Perhaps the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, right? The gospel of the kingdom may be preached in all the world, right? What does it say? The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in part of the world, in half of the world, to a few people in the world, no, in all the world as a witness to what? To all nations. Now notice, all the gospel will be preached in all the world, to all of the nations, and then shall the end come. That means will come. God's promises are true. God's promises never let us down. And the one thing that we need to be clear about is that the mission is God's. The mission belongs to God. Because beyond what our eyes can see, God is working with His Holy Spirit. Beyond what our eyes can see, God is sending angels from the sanctuary in heaven to lead people to the light of the truth. Beyond what we can possibly imagine, God is at work. The mission is His. We don't need to worry about ourselves. We don't need to be over anxious. We don't need to be depressed that the gospel is not going any faster. The mission is not ours. The mission belongs to God. We have a glorious joy and a wonderful privilege of cooperating with God in his mission. But one thing we need to be clear about is with, it's this. Whether you or I choose to participate in his mission or not, he is going to get the job done. The sovereign God is going to get the job done. The message of Jesus is going to go to the ends of the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And he gives us the joy, the privilege. I mean, think about it. What can be a higher privilege? What can be of greater joy? What can be of a more glorious opportunity than to cooperate with God in what he's doing to finishing the work on earth? Now, we have learned 
the promise of the Spirit was given back to the disciples in the first century. And the same promise is given to us. Let's review the promise with, with, with our theme verse of the entire series in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Not only has God given us a great commission, He has given us a great promise. Read with me. Ready? Let's go. But you shall receive what? After the Holy Spirit is came upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses unto me both where? In Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the what? Uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus said to the disciples, you will receive power. When Jesus said that to the disciples, 120 disciples met in the upper room. And you know, I was interested in recently doing some demographic population studies on ancient Rome. You know, the ancient Roman Empire had approximately 180 million people living in it. Now you, you read different you know, figures depending on how far you, you go to, you know, from the empire, but if you take the empire to the furthest reaches, Rome had over one million people living in the city, but the empire had about 180 million people. Now, if you use the numbers only given in the Bible, if you have 120 that met in the upper room, and Jesus said to them that you're going to actually receive power, and the Holy Spirit is going to pour, be poured out upon you, and you're going to go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel and give everybody an opportunity, 120 met in the upper room, 180 million were in the empire, that means there was one Christian for every 1.4 million people. What's the population of the state of Maryland? How many? In the, in the 2020 census, it's about 6.1 million people. 18th in the nation. So think about this. If the ratio back then is 1 to 1.4 million, that's the equivalent, right? Using the ratio of the Roman Empire, that's the equivalent of four Christians in the state of Maryland. I just want to put things into perspective. What if right here today, God gathered four Christians and said, within a matter of 40 years, the gospel will go to every person in Maryland. Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, you know, you're not with me yet. 120 met in the upper room. The ratio was 1 to 1.4 million. And Jesus says, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you, and I'm going to do something that you cannot believe. Something that is going to be amazing. Now, when you look at Jesus' promise in the book of Acts, there are three aspects of that promise. There is the all-encompassing nature of the promise. There is the all-embracing condition to receive the promise. And the all-empowering results of the promise. So let's look at these three aspects throughout the whole Bible study. First, the all-encompassing or complete nature of the promise. I want you to see how embracing the promise that Jesus gave to us was. Jesus called those disciples, those 120, and he said, I'm going to put out my spirit upon you, and here's the promise. Acts 2 and verse 17. Go there. And you're going to, we're going to stay in the book of Acts. Acts 2. And verse 17, listen to what it says. Come on, get it. Go there. Acts 2, 17. Listen to what it says. You're reading with me. It says this. And it shall come to pass. I love the certainty of those words. And it shall come to pass. In the, in the what? In the last days. In the last days, friends, this was fulfilled at Pentecost as a miniature of what is going to take place in our day. The promise will be fulfilled in its largeness in our day. Saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon what? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall what? See visions. And your old men shall what? Dream dreams. Now, I'm interested in that expression, upon all flesh. <laughs> you see, the Holy Spirit, in the past, had been poured out in an individual here and there. But just before the coming of Jesus, God will have a representative portion of his church 
that is seeking him. A portion that is, has an undivided heart. A portion that is reading his word. I, uh, we, we will see a, and upon that all flesh, just like the all flesh of the 120 in the upper room, we will see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in an abundant measure in the last days like we cannot imagine. Now, God is going to do something so amazing. You see, the darkness of the world will be met by the greater light. The need of the world will be met by the greater power. The lack of the gospel will be met by a power to take the gospel. The marvelous working of Satan will be met by the mighty works of God. The devil will work with all power from beneath, but Jesus will work with all power from above. And the Holy Spirit will come in marvelous ways. Friends, as the disciples prayed, confessing their sins, seeking God for power to proclaim his grace, the floodgates of heaven opened and the rain of the Spirit poured down upon them. And it, that, that was just a prelude of what Jesus is going to do with us. <laughs> you see, I know what you're saying, amen. All of you are afraid of getting this power. Because it's going to change your priorities right, that you have right now. That's the problem. We like the life that we have right now. No, 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 I don't want anything messing up with my schedule. It will change your priorities. I mean, notice Acts 2 and verse 4. Read it with me. It says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Languages that they never learned got placed in their hearts and their minds. And they proclaimed those languages, and the gospel went forth with power as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now notice in Acts 2 and verse 17, it says, Your sons and your daughters show what? Come on, show what? And your young men shall see what? Visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. How can he say this? Because we already found out that the Holy Spirit has, is no respecter of gender. Your sons and daughters. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. It's going to be poured out on male and females alike. God is going to move by his spirit. What do you say? Come on, folks, wake up. And as you can see, God has no respect of age. Somebody ought to say amen to that too. Amen. See, the Holy Spirit will be poured out without measure of, our, of your young and your old. God is no respecter of age. You see, maybe I'm encouraging somebody here or at home. How old was John when he had the vision of the book of Revelation? How old? In his 90s. How old was Moses when he led the children of Israel out of Egypt? In his 80s. How old was Daniel when he was taken into captivity in his teens. God is going to use the young and the old in the last days of earth's history. God has no respect for gender. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on men and women. He is no respecter of age. It is going to be poured out on the young and the old, on all flesh. But notice what else it says in verse 18. The Holy Spirit will be poured out on my servant and on my handmaidens. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, he has no respect for social status either. It is not the bank account that one has, nor the credit cards that you have in your wallet. It is not the corporate boards where, that, that you sit in. God will use anybody that he can use. Rich and poor. Huh? Free and bond. Wealthy and, and poverty stricken. Black, white, Asian, and everything in between. God is looking for people, folks, that he can pour his spirit on in abundance. And I thank God of the promise that he will pour out his spirit on what? All flesh. No respecter of gender, no respecter for age, no respecter for social status. Our God is an equal opportunity employer. Yes, sir. Now, throughout the Old Testament, 
God poured out his spirit in individuals. But in Pentecost, he did something different. He poured out his spirit on the church. Notice this statement from the book's Acts of the Apostles, page um, 50. Listen to what it says. Let's read this together. It says this. The lapse of time was wrought no change in Christ's parting promise to send the Holy Spirit as his representative. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of his grace do not flow earthward to man. Uh-oh. Something is wrong then. Because if God is not restricting it, what is? Let's keep on reading. If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. If all were what? Willing. All will be what? Filled with the Spirit. Wherever, oh, this is, this is, this, wherever the need of the Holy Spirit is a matter little thought of, there is seen spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension, and death. Why are you so quiet? Oh, no, 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 it keeps going. Whenever minor matters occupy the attention, job, money, school, family, tiredness, whatever problems or issues or concerns occupy your attention, the divine power which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church and which will bring all other blessings in its train. <laughs> you don't understand. You you're all quiet. You can stay quiet. I'm just going to enjoy this all by myself. Everything that we just said will bring all of the other blessings that you want in a train. So whenever that is lacking, though offer an infinite what? Plenitude. You see, <laughs> I, I, I challenged you last Sabbath to say, Lord, Show me somebody that needs the gospel. Did you dare to pray it? Don't, don't answer that question. Oh, but it continues. I love the part of the statement that says, if we are all willing, all will be filled with the Spirit. Are you willing? Are you, are you really willing? Do you long to be filled with the Spirit? Because, friend, the promise of the Spirit is for you and it's for me. It is for our church. It is for our conference. It is for the union of churches that we are part of. It is for our division. It is for our general conference. The promise of the Spirit is ours. Folks, what happened in the book of Acts? will be powerfully repeated. You might wonder, how can I receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit personally? Let's review one more, one more time because this is essential for all of us to find out how to finish this work. Grab your Bibles and let's go through a journey of the book of Acts. And I want you to see what happened in the book of Acts. Okay? Because what happened there was so remarkable and amazing. You're looking at Acts chapter 2, we were there already, and we're going to look at the numbers in the book of Acts and see how God moved through the Holy Spirit. When the disciples woke up in the in Pen, uh, Pentecost morning, they had no idea what God was about to do. They had no idea that the Holy Spirit would be poured out so dramatically that it would change the history of the world. Acts 2 verse 41, go there. Acts 2.41, read, it says, Then they that gladly, what? Received his word, were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them, about what? 3,000 souls. See that? By the way, for those people who um, think that a soul is separate from the body, I'll just show you that 
not 3,000 ghosts were baptized that day. So they woke up in the morning, 120. They went to bed that night, 3,120. You got that? <laughs> One day. By the way, that's how many people were baptized in a day in the Adventist church. 3,000. But the Spirit was poured out so powerfully that watch what happens now. Go to Acts chapter 4. And go to verse 4. It says this. Acts 4 and verse 4. It says, How be it? Many of them which heard the word believe. And the number of the man was about what? 5,000. And you add women and children, that's about 15,000. Now here you have in a few days after Pentecost, there is at least 18,120. Oh, but it gets better. No, no, it gets better. It gets better. Go to verse, go to verse 31, same chapter. It says this. And when they have prayed, when they have what? Pray. Praying. They place, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And this happened after they had what? Prayed. See, the Holy Ghost continues to fill them, not only in the book of Acts, but the infilling of the Holy Spirit is not something we, we, you know, we get once and for all. But like, like we have been actually telling you, God invites us to be filled with the Holy Spirit every single what? Day. There's no Tesla Holy Spirit battery. Oh, I'm going to just wait. I'm just going to just, 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 you know, store a little bit for tomorrow. You can do it. You have to ask for the infilling of the Spirit every day. All right, look at verse 33. Verse 33, just go down a few verses. It says this, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. So what's happening here? Acts chapter 2, 3,000. Acts chapter 4, 5,000. Then you include women and, uh, you know, and children, 15,000 more. Great power is given. Now let your eyes scroll to, uh, you know, go to um, Acts chapter 5, verse 14. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. Watch this. It says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. They have so many coming in by Acts chapter 5 that the Holy Spirit is so powerfully poured out that they cannot even count the people anymore. All they said, the clerk said, how many? Multitudes. Yeah. I, I, go, to, go to chapter 6 and verse 7. Chapter 6 and verse 7. Listen to what it says. It says, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests <laughs> were obedient to the faith. The Holy Spirit is being poured out. Multitudes were added. They cannot even count the people anymore. Thousands are coming in. Religious leader who crucified Christ. Yell, crucify him. They were so moved by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they repented. They, they accepted Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now the priests are coming to, to Christ. Looking at Acts 8. Acts 8. Yes, Acts 8, you know, Philip goes over to Samaria, and, and as Philip goes to Samaria, he preaches hard. And Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, it says, Therefore, they were scattered abroad, went, went, to, wait, no, went everywhere preaching the word. Everywhere. Where are you going? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm just moving. Philip goes down to Samaria. He preaches the word, and thousands accept. So the gospel is going to Jerusalem, and the gospel is going to Samaria. Philip is then taken away by the Spirit. He meets the African man, very influential, and the treasurer of the queen of Candace of Ethiopia, and he shares the gospel with him. The African is baptized. He goes down to Africa, and the gospel is open in Africa. And the great continent is moved by the, by the, by the Spirit of God, by the love of Jesus. The fact that Jesus 
He, they said, what? He's coming again? The Sabbath truth goes to the continent of Africa. Let me tell you something about Ethiopia. Ethiopia was the center of trade. There are multiple trade routes that came up, you know, came through Ethiopia. And all of Africa learned the truth by this one man. See, God uses a man. God uses a woman. I tell you, God has been so good to me because when I was preaching in Ghana, I learned, you know, when the Ashantes um, have a, a, a male child, they name that child based on the day of the week that that child is born. So you, you, have you ever heard the name Kwame? You know what that means? Kwame is a male child of the Ashanti tribe that is born on Saturday. You know that the literal translation of Kwame means? One who belongs to the creator. Now, why does the Ashanti tribe name a child born on Saturday one who belongs to the creator? Because the gospel went through Ethiopia by that Ethiopian and brought Jesus and his love and all the truth, including the Sabbath. And when the Guyanese traders came to Ethiopia, when they accepted Jesus and the Sabbath truth, they brought it back to their culture. Now, here's something even more fascinating. Do you know what a male child that is born on the first day of the week is called? In the Ashanti language, it's quasi. You know what quasi means? Foreigner. So why is Saturday called the day belonging to the Creator? And why is Sunday called the day belonging to the foreigners? You know, when I was walking down the street of Kumasi, um, you know, the Kumasi tribe, when my friend Bruce, they will call him Quasi Brune. Brune means white. They were telling him white foreigner. Quasi Brune. Now, let me give you some history. When the missionaries from Europe, from the Catholic Church, came to Africa, they introduced the day that was foreign to that culture. And, that, that, the, and the result of that, on the, uh, the Ashante, uh, the, the, that, that is foreign day. They named Sunday Foreign's Day, the Quasi Day. They named Saturday the Kwame Day, the day that belongs to the Creator. So you see, when you look at the book of Acts, something incredible is happening in a very few sh uh, short years. Thousands are being baptized in a very few short years. The gospel is going to Samaria, it's going to Judea, and in a few short years, the gospel is going throughout Africa. The gospel is going throughout Europe. The gospel is going throughout Asia. It is amazing when it, what is taking place now. Now look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. Are you there? Come on. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. <laughs> because here's the scripture. You know, I'm not talking something that is crazy. It says, And they had their churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were what? Multiply. What's been multiplied? The church. You see, you're not only having people being baptized and coming to Christ. The Holy Spirit is so heavily being poured out in those churches and they're being multiplied everywhere. And you cannot count the number of believers because there's so many thousands that they have to say, you know what, just go look at the churches to see how many people there are. One last passage of the book of Acts, all right? Please go to Acts chapter 21. Acts 21. And, you know, the whole book of Acts comes to this glorious climax, Right? It is, a, it is a, an amazing word to summarize what is taking place from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Acts 21 and verse 20. Read it with me, please. It says this. And when they heard it, they what? Glorified, glorified the Lord. When they heard the preaching of Jesus, they glorified the Lord. When they heard the report of the, Gal of the Gentiles receiving the, the, the gospel, when they heard the report of what God was doing, they glorified the Lord. And said unto him, Thou see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous 
of the law. How many Jews were actually of those who believed? Thousands. Now, folks, if you have a marginal um, reference in your Bible, especially if you have the King James Version, that, that you know, uh, in the King James Version, the original language, you find the word myriads. The word myriads means thousands upon thousands. So you start in Acts, in the book of Acts, with 120 believers who were seeking God in prayer. God poured out his spirit so powerfully, so incredibly, that by the time you come to the end of the book of Acts, they are tens of thousands. You know that most sociologists of Christianity say this, within a 40-year period, as clear as they can tell, there were one million believers by the time you come to the end of the book of Acts. They went from 120 to a million in 40 years. So let's go to the statistics. In Acts chapter 1, you have 120 believers, 180 million people in the empire, a ratio of 1 to 1.4 million. By the time you, get, you come to the end of the book of Acts, there are 1 million believers to 180 million. That is not 1, one to 1. 1.5 million anymore. It is 1 to every 180. See, it's amazing what starts to happen within 35 to 40 years. And we are told that what happened there is simply a prelude of what is going to happen soon. See, God is up to something. And we have been dealing with the question, how can I receive the Holy Spirit? How can the church receive the Holy Spirit? How can the church receive the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit? How can the Spirit come upon all the flesh? We've been studying this in this series, and so we're going to review now so we can put it all together. All right? Jesus has promised the all-embracing conditions. We already talked about the all-embracing power or, or, you know, powerful nature of the promise. So what are the conditions to receive the Holy Spirit? Luke 11 and verse 13. I'm not waiting for you because I am hungry. Read it together with me. It says this. All of you know me. I'm hungry. Here we go. Luke 11 and verse 13, especially when God did actually this, this morning at 3.15 in the morning. Psst, get up. Uh, Luke eleven thirteen. I love my Jesus. Luke eleven thirteen says this. If you then, being what? Come on, say it with pride. Being what? Know how to give gifts to, to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that what? I love this. How much more? How much more God has for you? How much more that God has for me? How does he, uh, how much more he has for us? What are those two words? Much more. God has much more than you can imagine. God has much more than you can think of. God wants to do much more with the movement that you can imagine. God wants to do much more with our media program that we can imagine. God wants to do much more with our literature evangelism. God wants to do much more with our Bible study. You see what happened last Sabbath in the literature evangelism is nothing compared to what is going to happen soon. Much more with our health programs, much more with our personal witness. You see, we may not know it yet, but God wants to do much more with you. You see, there are gifts that he wants to unfold in your life. There are blessings that he wants to give you. He wants to use you much more. Let me ask you something. Has Jesus done anything for you? No, no, come on. Let's talk about this. Has Jesus done anything for you? Then why don't you share that?
this is what we're talking about. It has nothing to do with preaching. You know, I, I do more soul winning at Costco than what I do here. Oh, yesterday, Gordon and I were just, you know, we're just doing, doing evangelism at Costco. Oh, you need prayer? Hold on. And we pray right there in the aisle. Has Jesus done anything for your family? Has Jesus done anything for your marriage? Has this Jesus done anything for your health? then why don't you share it? See, the Heavenly Father will give His Holy Spirit to those that do what? Ask Him. Are you asking Him? Friends, if you don't ask, will He give the power? No. He says one condition for receiving the Holy Spirit is purposely and intentionally ask. I triple dare you. Do it. Do it tomorrow. Wake up and say, give me your Holy Spirit and help me find somebody that needs Jesus. If he has done something for you, then share it. Let's read the, you know, this statement from the Testimonies to the Church, volume 8, page 38. We need to read this together. Counsels given to us. Now, again, if you want to do it or not, That is your choice. Amen? Yeah. It says this. My brethren and sisters, plead for what? God stands back of every promise he has made. God stands behind every promise he has made. Do you believe that? Has he promised the Holy Spirit? Will he give his Holy Spirit? Are we going to see the outpouring in abundant measure? The reason why God invites us to earnestly pray for the Holy Spirit is not because he is unprepared to give us his spirit, but because we are unprepared to receive it. The reason he tells us to seek him is not because he doesn't desire to give it, but but because but we do not thoroughly, fully, completely at times desire to receive the Holy Spirit. It's not that God is reluctant. It's that at times we are reluctant to fully surrender to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, Jesus, and allow him to do everything that he wants to do in your life. God wants to do something amazing, some amazing things with you. It's not human plans that are going to finish God's work. It's not human methods that are going to finish God's work. Literature is not going to finish God's work. Giving Bible studies is not going to finish God's work. Media is not going to finish God's work. He will use those things. Those things are agencies that God uses. Praise be to God. But I'm going to tell you something. All the machinery in the world without the power of the Holy Spirit will be powerless to finish the work of God on earth. The one thing that we need more than anything else is the abundant outpouring of the latter rain and the abundant outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Look at this statement. Review on Herald. It says, Do not rest satisfied that in ordinary course of the season the rain will fall. Do not rest satisfied. Ask for it. We must seek his favor with a whole heart if the showers of grace are to come upon us. We got to seek with all of our hearts. God longs to pour out his spirit upon the church. And if God did it in the first century, God is going to do it again. God is going to pour out his spirit and I believe that he's going to do it. Some amazing things are happening. Seeds were, that were sown years ago are coming to fruition now. Let me tell you a story. A pastor in Indonesia tells a story about the chief of the remote island with about 5,000 people. The pastor said that 40 years you know, before, 
uh, you know, his father was a pastor among the islands in the South Pacific. The island was about two and a half hours of Australia, a little tiny island, never impacted with the message of the Adventist church and the Sabbath truth. But 40 years ago, an Adventist pastor went and studied with the old chief of the island. The chief said, no, I'm not interested right now. Members of a non-Christian religion came to the island, and the chief said, hey, you're welcome to the island, but if you do, I'm going to chop your head off. Come on in. No problem. But please know that you're going to die. Of course, they didn't come in. The old chief had had Bible study with the Adventist pastor 40 years before, and he wasn't interested. 40 years later, the older pastor said to his, you know, to his son, you know, go, go in the speedboat to that island. I remember that old chief. Let's see what the interest is now. The son came back. The chief said, I am ready for you to stay. The boy stayed. He was now a young pastor. He studied the Bible with the old chief, and he said to the chief, hey, you know what? An evangelist is coming to, the, to preach, and, and it's only one week by boat. You want to come? Why don't you go? And, and you know, you know what? the chief came, but you know when the chief comes, he doesn't come alone. He brought his wife, his family, his children, other people, and the chief came to talk about, you know, hey, the chief came, you know, to talk to, you know, Pastor Mark Friendly was the evangelist, and he said, you know, I've been studying the Adventist message for 40 years, and I wasn't ready for a then pastor, but I'm ready now. Will you baptize me? And they baptized the chief, they baptized the wife, they baptized the children, and the chief said to the pastor, hey, can you send some missionaries to my island? I'm the chief. Could you make me, can, I, can you make a video of me getting baptized as a seven-day Adventist? I want, the, I want my people to study. And they did. And he looked into the camera, and the chief said, I have taken my stand for Jesus, and I'm going to invite you to do the same. I'm coming back to the island a different man, a seven-day Adventist man. And he said to Pastor Finley, send missionaries. Well, we'll do it. But you got to do one thing for us. What is it? You have to provide a place for the missionaries to stay. The, the chief actually got a big smile on his face. He said, Pastor, don't worry about that, man. My house has 14 rooms. I'll make sure that they get a room. 40 years ago, the seed was sown. The Holy Spirit is working. I, you know, I'm telling you, Pastor Philly, you know, I had the privilege to actually sit with him many, many times. He can tell you all the stories. You know, like the time he told me about the wife, his wife, um, Ernestine, they visited the king of the, and the queen of the Zulus. And the Zulus, they have about 30 million in southern part of Africa. And they were televising an evangelistic campaign through South Africa. And one day they got a phone call from the queen of the Zulus. And the queen of the Zulus said to the person who answered the phone, we didn't see Pastor Finley this Monday night. And the person said, you know, the reason why you see him is because we don't transmit. He's not preaching on Monday nights. She said, you know, we're watching from the palace every day. We installed a satellite dish in the palace. How would the queen of the Zulus have a satellite dish in the palace which watching a seven-day Adventist television? Let me tell you. What happened was when the queen of the Zulus was a little girl, she was the princess, and her father was the actual king of the Zoro. An Adventist choir used to come there and sing. And when those Adventist choirs would come to sing to the king, he loved religious music. Some of those Seventh-day Adventist ladies would take little candies out of their pockets and give them to the princess. You know, it may have been, now, granted, it may have been some healthy candies. Uh, anyways, they gave them to the princess. It's a story. I know some of you are about to faint. <sighs> she always remembered their kindness. And, 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 and as she was older, she was married. The princess was married now to the king of the Zulu tribe. And she, she has seven palaces. Incidentally, he was educated at Harvard University. 
He jet around the whole world. This, this, this guy was no joke. And, and it's amazing when you go to the palace, you know, you actually sit down and you can see elephant tusks on, you know, on the table. All right? And the people, you see, people need to be educated before you go into royalty and see them. So this is what happened. The little girl remembered the Adventist, you know, kindness. And when she was married to the king, they had some real problems, tribal problems. You know, he, he, he had 500 tribal chiefs. And these problems impacted his health. And she said, you know what, we need somebody to pray for us. And he, she remembered those Adventist prayers from that choir ladies. So she found an Adventist pastor, and he came to the palace. He prayed for the king, and as the king was getting better, the king said, you know what, stay for a little while. Study with us. The pastor stayed in the palace for three weeks and studied the entire seven-day Adventist message. He left. One day, the queen was sitting in the palace. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't looking very well. She was kind of downtrodden. And it was Sabbath, and the king came by, and he said, Your majesty, what's the matter? What's the matter, Madam Queen? Oh, I know what's the matter. It is Sabbath, and you want to be with your people. Call the royal limousine and go. Can you imagine being in that church, and the royal limo pulls up, all right, with all the bodyguards, and the queen gets out? She was baptized as a seven-day Adventist. The queen of the Zulu tribe, now dead in 2021, is our sister. See, God is doing some incredible things. I'm telling you, when God gets on the move to finish his work, he's going to do it. So what are the steps to this revival that I'm talking about? And I'm just coming to an end. Now I'm just coming to the landing. Here's what Evan Roberts says, talking about the, the Walsh revival. You know, what are the steps to the mighty spiritual revival? Very similar to the Bible. He said, number one, seek God and confess all known sin. In other words, pray. Number two, deal with and get rid of any doubt in your life, meaning commit your life to Jesus. Number three, be ready to obey the Spirit instantly. In other words, when the Holy Spirit convicts you to do something, don't play games with God. Don't push that out of your mind. When the Spirit convicts you of something, say, Jesus, yes, I'm going to do it. And number four, Evan Roberts says, confess Christ publicly. In other words, witness. Do you want the Holy Spirit in, in that abundance? Seek God in prayer. Have an undivided heart. Commit your life to Jesus. Listen to the Holy Spirit's working. Be sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit as Jesus changes your life continually. And he fills your life with greater power. And he anoints you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit every day. And every day you're going to be able to share and share and share. Because the more you share Jesus, the more we grow in Jesus. The more you share the message of the Bible, the more it is anchored in our hearts and in our lives. And the more our faith is strengthened. I'm telling you, if God impresses something in your heart, impression without expression leads to depression. If God impresses you to do something and you don't do it, you're going to feel a dark cloud surrounding you. When God convicts you of sin, do it. When God impresses you to witness, do it by the grace of God. And, and feel the joy and the acceleration that God gives you. I know what I'm talking about because I did not want to preach. I didn't want to be an evangelist. But the, the more the love of God impressed my heart, the more I had to share, to share that love with others. And friends, the latter rain power comes from witnessing it comes from men and women on their knees praying that God will anoint them with the Holy Ghost. Praying that the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon them. God will have a final generation of men and women when, whom you, he uses to complete his mission on earth. God is going to get the job done. You can count on it. And then we're going to see the results. 
Revelation 18, 1 is the result. The earth was lightened with his glory. The candle of truth will not be blown out by the winds of apostasy. The candle of truth light, it, it will light a flame. A bonfire will burn for the glory of God. Evil will not have the last word. God will. Disease will not have the last word. God will. Poverty will not have the last word. God will. Sickness will not have the last word. God will. Suffering will not have the last word. God will. Man will not have the last word. Who will? God will. God is going to do something amazing. And let me tell you, let me, let, let, let me talk to you about, about something that we, did, we don't like to talk about. It's my favorite author. You know, and I love how Ellen White takes the prophecies of the Bible and expands upon them. And let me be very clear. The gift given to God's last day church does not contradict or replaces the Bible. It merely expands as it, you know, what is there already. Look at her commentary on Revelation 18.1. In the visions of the night, representations passed before me of a great reformatory movement upon God's people. There's going to be a revival. There's going to be a reformation. There's going to be a great reformatory movement. The sick were healed. healed. The other miracles were wrought. A spirit of intercession was seen. What is the spirit of intercession? What is intercession? Prayer. So here are churches that come early Sabbath morning and they're praying. Here are churches that have meetings on Wednesday nights when they are, they're on their knees praying and seeking God. Here are small groups of homes. A spirit of intercession was seen even as, as it was manifest before the great day of Pentecost. It continues. Hundreds and thousands, now that's not a few, were visiting families and opening before them the word of God. Hold on for a minute. <laughs> she says, I saw in the vision by night. These are the last days. And she has this vision. She sees in the vision of, a, 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 of the night. Do you think that she saw real people going out and knocking on doors? Or were these just shadowy figures? If this was the last days, and if she saw real people on their knees praying, did she see you in your prayer meeting on Wednesdays? And the visions on the night, they, this scene passes before me. They, they must have been real people. Did she see you knocking on that door? Did she see you giving Bible studies? Did she see you sharing that literature? Did she see you using whatever gifts it is that God has given you to share with others? Hundreds and thousands were seeing doing that. Visiting families and opening for, before them the word of God. Hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the latter rain. This is the loud cry. And a spirit of genuine conversion was manifest. On every side door were thrown open to the proclamation of the truth. Folks, we have seen nothing yet. Doors thrown open to the proclamation of the truth. And then he says, the world seemed to be lightened with heavenly influence. Great blessings were received by the truth and humble, the, and humble people of God. I heard voices of thanksgiving and praise. And, I, I, and there seemed to be a reformation such as it was witnessed in 1844. It happened at Pentecost. God is going to do it again. It happened in the early Advent movement. God is going to do it again. There are those negative voices that say, oh, the world can never be reached. There are too many people in Germantown, Mario, and we have too few people at the movement. They cannot be reached. There are those that say, hey, look, look at the apostasy in the church. We need to branch off and start a separate movement. You don't want to step off the boat now. You don't want to step off the boat now and go into a tumultuous waters. God is going to shake out the world. He's going to shake out the Laodicean complacency in the church. God is going to have a church that is purified. 
a church that he pours out his spirit upon, a church that he moves through. The Holy Spirit will move through God's people. The church will arise as the sun arises. As terrible as an army with the banners and as prophecy says, it will have no spot or wrinkle or any such things. God is going to have a people that will be totally committed to him. He will pour out his spirit upon his praying people. Of people studying the word. And all that Jesus Christ did for me 18 years ago was says, come. It's come. He called me that first. And I didn't want to do it. And then and I were engaged already to be married. Minette, faithful to her faith, gave me my engagement ring back and gave me a step to Christ. And said, I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to lift you up to the altar of the Almighty God. All I want you to see is what I'm seeing. I want you to experience what I'm experiencing. I want you to see Christ crucified as I'm seeing him. With blood running down his face. Bearing the guilt, the shame, the condemnation of the sins of the entire world. That's what I want you to see. He was treated as we deserve so that we can be treated as, I, 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 you know, he was treated as we deserve so he can be, we can be treated as he deserves. He died the death that was ours so that we could live the life that was his. He gave his all for us so that we can give our all to him. And what is Jesus waiting for? Why hasn't the Holy Spirit been poured out in, on his abundance? It, it, it has been poured out down through the ages, but there's going to be an abundant outpouring right now. He's waiting for you and for me. To on our knees, seek him. To on his word, find him anew and afresh every day. To have the worldliness that entangles us out of our hearts. To have an undivided heart. He's waiting for us to have a passion for this world. A passion to share his love. A passion to share his grace. A passion that he returns. He's longing that we become so nauseated with this world. So sick of this world that we had desired just one thing. That our hearts long for heaven. That we long to be there. Would you like to bow your heads right now? And say, Jesus, burn into my heart that longing for heaven. Burn in my heart that longing for eternity. Doing my life more than I can imagine. More than I can ever hope for. Lord, use me in ways that make a difference in this world. Let us pray. Father in heaven. We continue to discuss in this series the mighty output, outworking of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the way that your spirit is moving. In fact, some people are here today because your spirit brought them here. We thank you that you want to take us and use us in ways that we can never, ever, ever imagine. We praise you for that. We thank you for that. We love you. And we open our hearts to you right now. And we ask him one thing. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Transform us, us by the divine grace. And thank you that you're going to use us in ways that we can never imagine. And that we can be part of your closing work. We can anticipate and we can participate with you and your mission to the world that's what we want make that a reality and Lord if someone here is struggling I 
and you have brought it amongst us. Holy Spirit, go touch them right now. Touch them. Bring peace to their lives. Let them know that everything is going to be okay. That a better day is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And that everything is going to be okay. And that everyone that is on his side will make it in. So Father, burn within our hearts to be on his side each and every day. Each and every day. And I ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.